Welcome to the Reticle Up Podcast, where I, Three Gun Kenzie, will be interviewing competitive shooters, hunters, fishermen, archers, entrepreneurs, and outdoorsmen. Come learn with me as I interview people from all walks of life, in different disciplines, all across the world, from novices to professionals of all ages. No matter what, everyone has something they can teach you. So come join me on the journey. Welcome everyone back to the Red Club podcast. So I'm here with Travis Tomasi. He is team captain for Masterpiece Arms, a multiple world and national IPSC and USPSA champion, army veteran and former member of the AMU. And then he's also a firearms instructor. So Travis, you live a, live a very busy life. Yes, very much. Thank you for that intro. It was wonderful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a lot of credentials. You've done all that, which is really impressive. Oh, shoot. Thank you. It's It's been essentially my whole life for so long. I can't, like 25 years or something like that. Yeah. I saw, so, who tagged you? Oh, Manny, uh, for your hot shot kind of day oh, you were in there. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. It was, they were following, uh, they were following Max and it just happened to be like an area match where we were shooting together. Aww. I remembered it now. Yeah. That was fun. That was cool to see that. Like that's a, that's a throwback. Mm. You, you know, this and you probably will be humble about it cause you're you, but it's like, you've impacted a lot of people. That's all your videos and like where you made it, you know, in, in this industry to want to shoot competitively. Gosh, I appreciate that. That, it makes it all the blood, sweat, and tears worth it to hear that. You know, if you can inspire somebody or, or uh, just to motivate them in some way, that's huge. I love it. It's, yeah, even the um, one, right? Yes, exactly. That's the truth. Great perspective. Amazing. Yeah. So actually, I don't know your background of like prior military, like growing up, like where are you from? Where did the firearms come into play and all of that? Yeah. So um, I'm from Seattle. Washington, uh, so Pacific Northwest, and uh, I basically grew up really into athletics. Soccer was my was really my main gig, and uh, I was really heavy into it, and did that through through college as well. And at some point, I would say I was probably a and I'm a late bloomer compared to a lot of people who are shooting now. Like I was probably 21, okay, or something like that. And my and my dad was shooting Ipsic since like the 80s. Wow. He was like, yeah, like mid eighties, you know, 45s and leather holsters. And, um, it was, it was different, you know, it was really cool. But, um, and he's like, Hey, uh, you know, why don't you come out to a match? I got, I can loan you some stuff. Um, and, uh, I was a little bit, uh, you know, team sports versus this is an individual sport when you're, you know, when you're on the clock, it's just you against you against the stage, you use against you. Exactly. And very different from like team sports. And I wanted to um, just try something new. And I was instantly hooked. I was just like, this is the cool. It's like racing with handguns. So what did you do the leather holster in 45 for the first time? No, 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 no. (laughs) That's actually good. I like it. I think, I think uh, a pops had some more uh, modern equipment by then, (laughs) but it was still like compared to today, it was still super old. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. So, okay. Yeah. Ipsic, um, you started in Ipsic, not USPSA. Well, it was by that point. Um, it was USPSA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was, uh, it was still a very, uh, I would say, you know, lower, ru- lower round count back then. Yeah. And, uh, probably uh, in some regards, higher difficulty, sure. um, maybe not all the way, but, uh, and then there was there was two divisions. You had open and limited. That's it. That's it. I didn't yep. know that. Yeah, which was uh, which was pretty cool too. And then the nationals were separate. So when you went to nationals, it was everybody. Whew. Yeah, wow. and um, I have all kinds of stories about that, but I don't want to bore you. But that That's was pretty not boring. Cool. That's what people want to know, actually. Like, yeah, what was so- your first nationals like? My first nationals, um, and Max, Max, Michelle, and I talk about this a lot because it was his first, even though he was like quite a bit younger than me. It was '95 in Reno, Nevada, at the Open Nationals, and uh, boy, that was a tough match. Really? Uh, yeah, it was really tough. And they even had they made an exception. They had the steel stage. It was Virginia count. That's not in the rules. <laughs> it's not in the rules, right? <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> and it was strong hand weekend on poppers. Oh no. Virginia camp. That is uh, a level of difficulty ooh. that I don't want to play with. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was crazy. And they're like, we're like, this isn't legal. Yeah. That's okay. Everybody has to do it. So <laughs> <That's> not okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I pay membership for this role. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. open was like the first, the first love that you had. It was absolutely. I, I probably started with like a, you know, like a, a Glock 17 or something in my first few matches. Yep. And then my dad had this, uh, he had a para um, open gun that he wasn't using. He'd already built like the Strayer trip type or what you would call the STI or 2011 at that point. And um, so I borrowed his para and, and it had a dot on it. And I was just like, oh man, <laughs> this is a different level. And that were like, I got to say a lot of that, the speed aspect to it really attracted me. And the dot goes along with that, especially when you don't have many skills. You know, I'd only been shooting a few matches when I got a hold of that dot gun. Were you a natural though, like shooting wise? I I think there were certain elements that that I was I was natural at, okay. um, but I would say that what what I really had going was I was obsessed. Yep. yep. Yes. You still like, are. I mean. Yes, absolutely. Still are. That is the truth. That is totally the truth. And I can remember giving that para back to my dad when it was time for. He's like, "Man, you got to build your own gun or get your own gun." <laughs> And uh, I gave it back to him and literally the bottom of it looked like a golf ball. All the mags were completely tore up and it was just me from dry firing four hours a day. Wow. You know, wow. just com completely obsessed. So this was self-taught too. Like you didn't go watch, there wasn't like YouTube or you didn't go pay for a class. Like you were like, all right, if I'm going to do this, like I'm going to do this. Great point. There was none of that information available online. Very few people were teaching. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so the only, I would say probably the, the, um, best resource I had available was Lenny McGill used to do these VHS tapes <laughs> of the nationals. <laughs> you have to have a, you know, VHS was the future at that point. <laughs> yeah, and, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it would follow the super squad. Okay. And I got a hold, uh, I got a hold of like an open one and a limited one. And, uh, I wore them out. I, the, to the point that they just they just were worn out. I don't know how many times. And then you know you pause and rewind and all that. And then you break your VHS. You wear the motor out. Oh man, that was my like my YouTube was okay. one of those. What, and who was yeah. your inspiration, by the way, that you watched? Like who was your heroes of shooting? Oh, that's a good one. So I would say it was what we called back then was the big three, okay. and that was uh, Rob Latham, Jerry Barnhart, and Todd Jarrett. Okay. Yep. And they, so they would be battling and they were the, I would call them like the money guys. I mean, they were, they had the big sponsorships and, yeah. and, you know, the, and they were factory pilots. They had, I mean, they, cause they deserved, I mean, they were amazing, but those guys, I would say, I tried to take something from each of them. Yeah. And it may be something different. One part of their technique resonated, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, oh, Todd's reloads or Jerry's yep. draw and just sort of, Sort of make an uh, amalgamation of the whole thing, and so neat. Yeah, so it was fun though. When you first met them, yeah. were you like fanboying a little bit? I I bet I probably was. I think I was. Uh, <laughs> I you know I'm an, I'm a massive introvert. Yes, and yeah. So um, I, I think I was. It, yeah, <laughs> I was a little bit. Um, a little standoffish a little bit at first, especially because uh, you have to understand the uh, first time I was in the super squad was 97 and I'd only been shooting for like a year and a half. Jesus, so incredible. literally I was a nobody. Well, yeah. And it was, it was uh, the first time was limited nationals in Virginia. And uh, again, it was just one match. So everybody is there. That's cool. And, and so here I am in this squad and uh, you know, I had an auto detail business. Okay. Yep. So living in Seattle and detailing cars. Wait, and, which uh, I have questions about the truck later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. I could probably, I try not to do it anymore, but. Uh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it. exactly. That was, uh, that was how I was, you know, uh, earning money to pay the bills and ammo and travel. And uh, so it was cool because I, you know, here's an auto detailer and you put them in the super squad and, uh, I really probably shouldn't have been there yet. I think I was like seventh or something in the match, but it was, 
you know, it was, it was a cool experience and you might as well get in there and get a sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. so at that seventh, you ended up seventh and limited. Yes. At your first nationals in a year and a half. Yes. Super. My first oh. super squad. Yeah. It probably shot two, two by then. Yeah. No, no. You were definitely meant to be there. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was crazy. It was a, di- it was a different, uh, but if, it was a different deal. That's like carry optics now, right? Like that's, that is the nationals to me. And that's like where everybody's shooting. So that's where the heat is. So seventh and carry optics. I mean, that's kind of like limited when there's only two nationals that holds a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it was all the, you know, top 16 back then was the big deal. We had a man on man shoot off. And, um, so it was the top 16 was pretty much all the same guys in open and limited. It's yeah. There were some guys that wouldn't shoot irons and then vice versa, but for the most part, yeah, it was, it it was awesome. It was a cool time to, I'll I'll tell you though. Also like the people that you looked up to sometimes, um, you know, they played a lot of games when they saw that you were a threat. Yes. And so that was something I had to deal with. Um, the super squad nowadays is a lot kinder and gentler. I'll tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) I can see that. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was, it was something. It was another aspect of the game. You had to learn how to deal with all that and watch your back. And, yeah, um, and that's not negative to anybody. There was a, back then there was a lot of money on the table. So yeah, this is how people fed them, their families. And, yeah, that makes sense. It's competition. Yeah. At the end of the day, there is competition. <laughs> there is exactly. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> for you, when did the army marksmanship unit come into play? Was that something that you were like eyeballing or is that something where you got like recruited? Oh, another great question. And this kind of goes to um, my first world shoot. The first time I, I made the national team, it was an open okay. and, and the t- we were, it was 2002 in South Africa and um, it was, Jerry Barnhart was the captain, Todd Jarrett, uh, Todd might have been the captain, Max Michelle and, and me. Wow. Yeah. And Max and I had, uh, he'd been at the, in the NAMU for shoot three or four years at that point, maybe three years and was coming up super fast was if he wasn't winning the area, he was second. Um, you know, I mean, he was, it was always really close and, uh, he, he offered to have me come down and train with him at Fort Benning. Wow in practice. He's like, why don't you come down here? You can stay, stay at my house and we'll go and practice all day and we'll get ready for South Africa for the world shoot. Wow. And I said, man, that sounds awesome. And immediately, um, just being there in that environment and then, and then seeing how well Max and I worked together, we were both super obsessed with this, this endeavor and just completely students of the game. And I think it probably would have been midweek. He's like, you need to start thinking about, uh, enlisting (laughs) and he's like you need to you know he's like I think you need to be on the team how old were you at this point too when he's this point oh for the army I was old like 28 27 something like that I mean that for the army yes yeah Yeah. for the army exactly uh yeah and so uh that was really the impetus right there and then and then Max uh uh, I, I I told the coach I'm like because he is really crazy because back going back to that going back to that 97 Nationals the uh, AMU coach gave me his card he's like hey been, we've been watching you why don't you join the army and be on the team and I'm like oh this is a, I really appreciate it but I'm not ready to join the army yeah and that was uh, shoot so that was 97 I didn't actually five years it. Yeah. yeah holy cow yes okay. yes. That's how that came about. And I was lucky. I kind of got a test drive to be down there. It's nothing like actually being in the ar- the army when you're just down there visiting and all that, of course. But uh, I got to see the, the, the uh, maybe the, the, the number of resources available and the opportunities. Yeah. If you want to be a shooter, a pro shooter. There's no better uh, university, if you will call it, a uni- you know. Oh, yeah. Right. Every single good shooter has come out of the AMU. Like there are others exceptions for sure, but like they're beasts. Yes, beasts. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. they've all gone to SIG or Glock or, you know, these major companies. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And then you ended up, was that how you ended up at Remington? I know we're like fast forwarding super mm-hmm. fast, but. That's okay. Yes, it is. I, I went to Para. Uh, Todd Jarrett had retired from Para. Um, I went there immediately out of the army and then Remington purchased us. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, okay. That's cool to know. I'll go back to that. <laughs> yeah. the AMU, though, I want to know, like, what was that like moving, you know, across country, completely across country. And then this is now your, your whole life and your career. Like, what was that feeling like? 
it was really exciting. It was a big step. Yeah. It was sure is a big step. And um, also, you know, we had just uh, basically starting the war, uh, the global war on terror. So, um, you know, the army was ramping up and we were uh, basically when I was in what they call MEPS, where you're signing up and getting tested, all that. Um, you know, we were we were invading. Uh, yeah, uh, Iraq. I mean, Iraq, it was, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was an exciting time in that way. Like um, also because. But it was a bit it was a big culture, shock, you know, almost like a culture shock for me going from like. <laughs> The Seattle, it rains every day and um, very liberal. Yes, and then freedom uh, and, and firearms and hot human. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, but also being an older guy, there's things about it that I appreciate. I want to say older guy, I mean, for joining the Army. Yeah. 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 Um, but that was, it was, it was cool. It was a great experience. It was, it was definitely ups and downs. Yeah. But it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I've, I've talked to some of the team members. I shoot a lot of like free gun with them and stuff. Like I know how cutthroat it is too, to keep your spot on the team and to, and all of that. So I don't know if you can talk about or share like what is, mm -hmm. I know the goal of AMU is to win. Like that's it to win. Right. So like, can you talk about like the process of staying on the team and training and like, what does that look like for you to have to keep up to keep your spot? Yes, absolutely. In fact, and when I went on, they had um, they had these things called gates. Okay. And so the coach would set the gate, and of course, it would be dependent on your skill level and where you were at that time. So I think I had maybe a a full year there before he said your gate is third at nationals. So at this point, you have to be. I have to place third at national, you know, in the top three, or possibly they would take my spot away or. Um, wow. My MOS was infantry, so they would be they would scoot you on over to eleventh, eleventh uh, ID or third ID, and um, <laughs> didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to shoot. I really wanted. I had this goal of being a national world champion. That was like my whole, my whole purpose in life, and yeah. you know, and I thought that I could. So the it's interesting because the mission of the AMU changes based upon the commander and he would basically write the, the mission statement. And when I got there, it was to win in international and national competitions. There were some other things, but that was basically it. So for example, my teammate, Max Michelle and I, we would, we would get up, we would do our physical training, you know, your PT and every, your army stuff. Then we go to the ammo bunker and grab a box of, you know, like a thousand rounds a piece <laughs> go out to the range <laughs> yeah start we'd be we'd be literally going hot by like mm, 0 7 30 let's say what okay yes shoot until lunch take a break get some get some lunch and then max and i would be back on the range after lunch and go to like you know 16 30 and then start cleaning up and you had to clean you had to you know You're police correct. the whole yes it has to be perfect yes and we did that Every day, I think I had that experience for probably at least six months, and then, <laughs> and then um, at some single point, at this time too. Like, did y'all have relationships, or is this just you two? Well, he was Max was. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Max. I was single, uh -huh. so this was like this is literally like and living in the barracks. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and. Um, but like this was my whole my whole thing. Max had Jen already. They hadn't been married. They were they weren't married quite yet. Okay. It happened a few years later. Um, but yeah, like I mean, this was literally all we did. Mm -hmm. And and then we'd go home and it sometimes we'd call each other and talk about, <laughs> well, what did we learn today? And what are we gonna change? And there was all these, you know, you're like, gosh, can you get burned out? You can. I mean, when it's all you do, it sounds awesome at first. It does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then a few months you're like, wow. Yeah. You know, this is well, eventually, so the the, the command changed and the mission statement changed to winning was put down further. And then the, the primary mission of the unit was training soldiers. Okay. So now I went from uh practicing all day long to doing a lot more instruction, writing a close quarters marksmanship wow. uh, course, and then teaching. And I was on a mobile training team. So I would go to, you know, bases everywhere and train. And I loved that. And it gave me a lot more experience in instruction and, wow. um, 
Yeah, it was awesome. And I mean, I was, I was still, I was teaching certain, certain groups and whatnot as a private, which is kind of crazy. It is. So, you know? and, and you didn't have any prior like leadership or like teaching instruction. This is just new. Right. No, no leadership. I was teaching um, competition courses before I did join the army. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I started that like in the first year of shooting, I started teaching classes just because um, at least in my area, there wasn't a lot of competition. So I was like winning all these matches. Luckily, you know, I was just lucky. And then, um, so people were like, we want a class and it kind of did. So I was like, you know, teaching almost immediately. I, I made, I think I made grandmaster in like nine months. And then, um, I was teaching at that point and which I loved. And then, you know, being able to, um, sort of like transfer all that knowledge and all that time that I invested, even though I'd only had like a year under my, sure. Yeah. I was still, it was still cool. Yeah. But then getting to do it in the army was, was really, really cool. I really enjoyed that. And it was a bad, it, you try to balance it with the competition thing. Like, okay, we got area four coming up mm -hmm. and in four weeks and I've got to teach, you know, I'm doing uh, the Rangers today and then I have another, some other guys next week. At some point, you know, I'm going to get out there with my gun and yeah. get some rounds in and then, and then go to the match. And um, that was, that was, I loved it. It was awesome. So did you meet the mission too, going back to like winning internationally and nationally with the army? Like what was that look like when you were AMU winning? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I feel fortunate. I was able to, at, um, it took me a few years before I started, um, I would say, you know, the first couple of years, uh, kind of, you know, top three at areas, second, win one here eventually. Um, <laughs> nationals was, I think I was probably like, I don't know, top five or something for a while. Okay. And I wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't breaking through. I wasn't getting the, the wins that I'd worked so hard for. And um, I got to tell you, somebody who made a huge impact on me was Max Michelle and who he started winning. He won nationals within a year of me getting there. Wow. Open nationals. Yeah. And, uh, he helped unlock a lot of things for me from a mindset standpoint. And, you know, his deal was you make winning a habit. And part of that habit is what it takes to prepare. Yeah. And then also the confidence aspect to it. And once I started winning, I finally, I was like third, or I'm sorry, I was second to Rob in limited for like three years in a row or something. It might have been more. And but I will tell you, it wasn't like I was really good. It was like me, and then there was another group below me. And but Rob still had like five to four percent over me. And then finally, I think it was maybe um the year before I first won my first nationals, um, we were within 10 points or something like that, super close. And then I was like, okay, you know, I'm ready to do this and made up my mind that I was going to. And that's, uh, you know, we could talk about that stuff later, but I decided that I, I was a national champion and I was going to do that. And so I did it. And then like three weeks after that, I won the Ipsic world shoot. So everything, I just kind of broke through at once. And so as far as the national international, yeah, I met that mission. Yeah, thank <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. obviously you stayed in there pretty long. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I did want to talk about that. So I know you have tested, <laughs> um, I speed caloric deficit and surplus and all of the different things to see <laughs> how we perform, which is brutal. Yes. <laughs> brutal. Um, yes. so I don't know if you want to go through like, you know, for the people listening, I think they would want to know how do you tell yourself, like, I'm going to make this class or I'm going to be national champion or, or whatever that looks like. And then once you decide and go do it like that, that is possible. Yeah. So first of all, um, and I see this in a lot of different students, everybody has a little different personality and everybody has different, like inherent levels of confidence and self-image. Mm -hmm. So, and it's something that I'm doing as an instructor, I immediately sort of scan the group and I can figure out where people are. Um, and but and also I know I can see I can see things, uh, especially in myself going back to that to that era where I hadn't like br broke through yet. Mm -hmm. And and I had like people telling me on the team, like, dude, you know, skill by skill, you can beat anybody. Mm -hmm. But 
you lose the nationals. You know what you need, what's going on here. You know, all you're lacking is the confidence at this point. And I'm kind of like a realist where I'm like, well, it hasn't happened yet. Um, there were several times where my gun broke, you know, where the extractor hook broke off or whatever it was, it was all this stuff and all of this kind of, it's like a monkey on your back and it, it starts to program your self image, all of this input, various levels of like, um, I would call them authority, like, uh, you know, just, just things that have an impact, a negative impact on you, negative situations, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, what it came down to being lower on the self-confidence scale is I had to almost lie to myself. Okay. Until you believe it. Yes, exactly. And think of it like a snowball, like you had to keep rolling it and you start in the beginning, it's tiny. And a lot of visual, you visualize, this is what really helped me was outcome-based visualization. So I already did unbelievable amount of repetitions of process-based. Mm-hmm. What this looks like, the sights lifting off the target, uh, you know, what the movement looks like, all this kind of stuff, calling the shots. But really, I needed to convince my self-image and my subconscious that I'm already a world champion. Yeah. And so in a lot of ways, it's, and I, like I say, I was lying to myself, but I had to do something to start that snowball rolling. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. And that was key. Some people, their confidence exceeds their skills. <laughs> they, they, you know, and, and that, that's a different type of thing that they have to learn to work on. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it was, it was, um, I had to believe in myself mm-hmm. and I did, I would did so much outcome-based visualization. Oh, cause what I, I was visualizing being on the stage at a world shoot <laughs> Holding the American flag. And you know what the song that was playing? Uh-uh. We are the champions. champions. Okay, nah. <laughs> but here's the crazy thing. I will never forget this. When it really happened, guess what song they played? No way. Yes. No way. No. The champions. I am not joking. That was like surreal. So I, and this is not in shooting because I haven't done that yet. But like I, I tell people to speak things into existence. So I do believe in nice. that a lot. Um, and you know, Jesse Lane, and I'm going to call her out, maybe not trying to tell her that, but it's the confidence thing where I've told her to lie to herself till she gets there and just tell her like in the morning, like, and she is this, I'm a badass. I'm a single mom crushing in life. I am doing great in the competitions and she's incredible. Right. So that mindset too, is, is, I don't know why I don't apply that to shooting, but in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But you, you found that it it works in the real world, right? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. And, so I wouldn't and be where does. I'm at if I wasn't saying I'm going to make it in this industry. I'm going to make it in this industry and just keep going. <laughs> so awesome. That's huge. Yeah. It's huge. And being able to um, verbalize it, not just uh, internally, but right. another thing that I had to do. And I told, and I told, like, if you have a circle, you know, people you trust, um, especially me, I'm not a um, like cocky person or anything like that. So I told him, I said, I'm going to start verbalizing what I'm going to do at nationals. I'm going to win nationals. Yeah. It's going to feel great. I'm winning. The, hey, guys, I'm winning. Nash. You know, and you start to do it in front of other people that may have been uncomfortable. That that works, too, as well. Or it's all a little bit of everything. You got to put a lot of, you know, a little <laughs> bit of everything in there. I yeah. think it helps. Uh, I call them accountability buddies. <laughs> so if you tell somebody like, hey, I'm going to do this, like it, it makes instead of just to yourself, then you're like, oh, people have heard me say that. Now I got to go do it. So there's that. Yes, it's really good. You're establishing intent. And intent is like the bridge between uh, awareness and action Mm -hmm. in in a way. I mean, it's so important. Just, just, uh, you know, it's almost like a contract and you're more likely to succeed, I believe. Absolutely. I agree. Now, how did you turn yourself (laughs) from an introvert to an extrovert? Because that had to be part of the process. (laughs) Yes, it was totally... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think it was more like, um, so when I started this shooting thing and I wanted to be like a, prof- a professional shooter and all that, <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that I didn't realize that point it, that it is pretty much an extroverted job. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I, it was a surprise. And I think that's part, it was part of the process was like, well, you're going to be doing, um, you know, and the AMU, I had to, I was constantly getting up in front of large crowds and whether I was demonstrating yep. or, or I was teaching or I was on shooting USA doing videos. Yep. Um, 
it's just sort of, yeah, it was like I was forced in order to pursue my dream. <laughs> no, I was like, okay, yeah, this is what you have to do. <laughs> and I don't, I wouldn't call you an introvert anymore. I think that you have completely changed to an extrovert because you've had to. <laughs> yeah, I think that's accurate. Yeah. 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 I think you got it. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you want to go into, I know we touched a little bit about like that, the mental stuff. Then where did all of that like nutrition testing come from? And like, how can people kind of figure out like what works for their body? You know, cause I, I teach a lot about that myself where intermittent fasting works for me. And like, this is my nutrition for me. And I can't eat a heavy meal in the middle of a match. Like I got a snack all day on like protein and stuff. Right. So how important is that stuff too, for shooters? Yeah, I think, I think it is. And I would, I would preface that by saying, um, regardless of your, your nutrition plan and your diet plan and how the big thing when you go into a match or you're looking for a performance is not changing anything radically. Yes. So, yeah. so if you don't IF, uh, every day, but then you go in into a match and you don't, you know, you don't eat for 16 hours, Oof. it may not be ideal for somebody, but if you're doing it daily and, and you're used to that, yeah. um, but yeah, so for me, it's really, I like to keep no, uh, I'm really obsessed with like the physiological processes involved in shooting, the neural, the neural science, all of that stuff. And so if I'm not shooting, if I'm not working or teaching, I'm studying that stuff. And so I wanted to know, or I still want, I'm still trying, I did carnivore for three months <laughs> just recently. I mean, I'm looking for any, anything Wait, that I can. So it's it's yeah. over. You tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> It, I lot well. <laughs> it was interesting. I made some interesting observations. So, um, <laughs> number one, I noticed that um, I dropped a ton of water weight, like okay. pretty much immediately. No, no carbs, right? I was strict. Uh, I meat, believe it. I butter. know you're. you're yeah, dizzy. you know me. I'm. I'm crazy. <laughs> so, um, I think one of the more interesting things, because I shot a few matches with it. Okay. Um, what is interesting to me about it is. You go, you go from being hungry, then you eat, you eat your meat and then you're not hungry, but there's no crash. There's no blood sugar or glucose spikes. Okay. So it's like, you're very level. Like even if you were low on sleep, uh -huh. um, it, it's kind of cool in that regard. I lost a little bit of weight. Um, I want to say weight, a little bit of fat, but a lot of water weight because the carbs <laughs> retain water, I, I believe. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you what, I don't think it's sustainable for many of us because it's like the same thing so often. I mean, I tried to mix it up, but yeah. yeah. Um, but the, I started this with, with trying to figure out how the, how the caloric, whether, you know, does a surplus mm -hmm. help your match performance? Does a, you know, how does a deficit affect it? So I was logging this stuff like crazy when I started this, this aspect, you know, of experimentation. Yeah. And, and figuring out my BMR as close as you can get um, activity levels, you know, logging, um, always logging steps and matches. And you, it's a lot of more steps than you think, isn't it? Yes. Every time with three guns are stupid. And then like working yeah. nationals was like, <laughs> I don't know, 40 miles in a few days. I never want to do that mm -hmm. again. I mean, and that, that is a good thing though, for people like me who doesn't like the gym and likes to be outside. So if I don't have to think about exercise, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah. I like that part about it. I agree. Totally. Yeah. Yes. You can skip the gym because you're yeah. getting so much. Yeah. And you're so I, kind of like, you know, it's a rough calculation, but I wanted to see um, how that affect, if it affected my, my, uh, my cognitive function, my athletic performance at a match. match. The problem is it's very hard to, to, to really nail it down because all right. stages are different. Right. Yep. And then, and then you have the travel effects and you yep. have, uh, there's uh, just a external lot of different... factors, work life. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So I could kind of get general guidelines to that where I, where I found, um, you know, you were a little bit better with a slight surplus Yeah, yeah. of, of good quality nutrition, um, Okay. That that was a little better, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get migraines if I don't eat. <laughs> Correct. Yes, yeah, so there's that's another problem. Exactly. And then I'm focused mm -hmm. on that and nothing else because I get yes. angry. Oh. Um <laughs> yeah, I hate shooting with a migraine. 
That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Not fun. Now, oh. the eye speed science and the neuroscience and all of that, like, are you watching videos? Are you reading books? Probably all of the above. And like, how are you training your eyes to see those sights lift and like call your shots? I, I don't know all that. I don't do that very well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, and this is a few different topics there. Um, <laughs> for example, well, let's run on the top of my mind is calling your shots. Okay. So, which is absolutely, um, anybody who's, who's listening to us or watching us right now, if, if this isn't a, a skill that you, that you've been able to grasp or understand or, or even be able to function, then I do recommend you dive into this ASAP because it's huge. It's huge. And it's a funny thing because there isn't like a, an exact science to it. Um, it's, you're essentially, it, and, and let me describe this. It's easier for me to describe this first. If you see a pistol fire it with a high-speed camera, so super slow-mo, mm -hmm. the first thing before the slide, the barrel drops, or any of that stuff, is you see a bunch of powder blow out the front. Mm -hmm. Then you see the uh, projectile to start to come out the muzzle. It leaves the gun. It's outside of the gun. Okay, there's no more influence that you can exert upon the pistol at this point. However, <laughs> nothing is moved yet. Wow. So there's a lag, there's a lag there. Okay. And and the way that for me, the best way to call the shots is just being aware of that initial movement of the front sight or the dot. Okay. The, like if you could, you know, the smallest measurement, that's the closest indication you have to where the muzzle was pointed when the bullet left the barrel. However, it is slightly behind. Right. Right. It's slightly behind. So some people are like, okay, I see where the sight returns. I'm like, let's be honest here. At that point, the bullet is in the berm and, and is oxidizing. <laughs> yeah, it's done. It's so far behind at that point. <laughs> yes. Because yes. for yeah. people that don't know, like calling shots, like when you're at your level, it's you literally you're finished with the stage and you can tell me every alpha, every Charlie, every Delta, whatever that you've had without looking at targets, looking at whatever, right? Like you, you shoot it and you know exactly where they're at. Yes. That's the goal. There will still be certain targets <laughs> where maybe there was a lack of focus or, sure. I, or I, you know, I broke away a uh, lack of follow through, mm -hmm. but the idea, the ideal, exactly what you said right there, that, that sums it up. Perfect. And a, a little, uh, a drill that Max and I used to do is you, we shoot a field course, you know, maybe medium to large. Right. And as soon, in, without looking at the targets, you unload show clear and you look back at the guy running you and you would tell him the four, four C's, you know, and then we would compare. But um, yeah, that's a great, yeah, okay. you summed it up perfectly. And that, that a lot of your training stuff is really like um, increasing eye speeds, like closing your eye, opening your eye, like as soon as you see your front sight, pulling trigger on target or whatever that looks like, or blind transitions. So you're, you're teaching yes. your eyes to think faster, I guess. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You're and you're being aware of in, in terms of visual processing. So, you know, your eyes are your sensors mm -hmm. and, and the optic nerves go back. It's all the way to the back of your brain, your, your uh, visual cortex. It is this long process to get back there. And then your brain has to process it and then send the signal to this guy. Mm -hmm. And by isolating and those drills, like we do in the class, you're, you're, I want you to increase your awareness of that process, essentially. Okay. No, it, you know, no, it's, you have no idea where that those neurons are in the, in the loop and all this, but um, the more I'm big into isolating, you yeah. know, the more you can break it down and then you can work on little pieces of it yep. and then put it together. And uh, it's the same thing with, same thing with eye speed. Cause okay. it's, uh, it's, yep. The, now, what about like trigger press and like teaching yeah. someone <laughs> like respecting the trigger and even like visual patience too? Like that's yes, that's not yes, fun. absolutely. So, um, you know, the trigger it, it it's interesting because it's so um, it's 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 important that you don't move the gun while you're functioning the trigger. And I like to break it down to the simplest act possible that regardless of how you your technique on the trigger is as long as the gun doesn't move until the bullet leaves the barrel. It doesn't matter if you're a slapper, if you're a prepper, <laughs> none of that stuff matters. 
What um, are you, Travis? So I, I depends on the target difficulty. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yep. I would say from even to ten yards, uh, I, I might be slapping. Slapper. It. Yeah. With the nineteen eleven, especially oh, some yeah. other platforms, I, I do, I do stay in contact with the shoe. Okay. As I get back further, then um, I do, I, like I said, I stay in contact with it. If it gets really difficult, um, I do actually feel the sear stack. Okay. And that that wall, and use the wall to your advantage. Mm-hmm. Like get up on it, and and reinforce through through repetition, feeling that wall, and knowing not to disturb the gun during that where you're going to go through it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, but and there's dry fire drills you can do. There's I'm always experimenting with new things to to, to for me that part that that is very perishable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really is like. I know what the sights need to look like, or I know what I can get away with with a dot visually. Um, but this guy can get me into trouble. Yeah, you know, I, I going from the rifle back to the pistol platform. I feel so dumb. Like I know how to oh, shoot pistol, yeah. but you just feel so dumb. Like no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cow. one of the biggest differences, I think. Besides, yeah. you know, having a grip and everything, but having to reload. What is that? Yeah, exactly. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's been fun. Um, awesome. Yeah. I'm curious, like the the average Joe, or maybe not the average Joe, but the person that is looking to be in your shoes, or like at least at a higher level. But, you know, they don't have the opportunity of the AMU or they don't have those, you know, high level opportunities. What do you recommend that they work on or do or read or watch or whatever that looks like? Yeah. So uh, and if I could go back and if I would continued without the army opportunity, um, I still believe I would have. I, no, you know, I, I would have. Yeah, I would have got there. <laughs> no, um, but I think it's important. Um, and, and this is we are inundated with free info these days, whether it's YouTube or you're looking at like forums or even the whole social media thing. Um, There's just this massive quantity of information that is just, um, you know, just being in, just flooding your brain. And I would, I would like somebody in that, in that respect, number one, to, I think it helps to find an instructor or someone you can look up to that you can trust. Number one, mm-hmm. that, and it doesn't have to be somebody who's been there, done that, you know, world champion or something. It needs to be somebody that can help you, yeah, and and get you to the next level. And another thing I would say is occasionally take a break from all this free information, yeah, yep, and figure something out on your own. That's what I used to do. And there's a lot of value in that. Yes. Um, Yeah. Pick anything, shut, shut this noise off and whatever it is, we were just talking about trigger or, or, uh, target transitions or I speed, whatever it may be and gets, get outside of the shooting industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get out, get out of the books and the YouTube and all that and go, go read maybe some tennis, some golf books. Um, and, and that's, that's something that I would recommend. To, Tennis to and you. golf are, are those single sports is what you're picking out too. Cause, um, <laughs> that's on the individual for the most part. Tennis, you play doubles, but that's all single sports. Yes. Okay. True. Good point. True. True. And I found, I found coming up, I found quite a bit of good material, mm-hmm. um, in, in, in those books and there's a lot more money yeah. and a lot, yeah. And a lot more people participating <laughs> than are, than are like 32,000 people. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like you, you have some very, uh, you just have, it's a very dense, a very competitive, yeah. you know? Uh, so I think there's a lot to learn. You know, some of the things don't transfer so good. They're doing, they're, they're performing at a very much slower rate and not so much on demand. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's certain things that won't transfer, but there's, there's a lot that there are. Yeah. But I do. I, I really like the idea of somebody uh, shut, shutting the noise off for a while and then making your own discovery. That, that helped me. So your class helped me exponentially figure out the things I was doing wrong, even applying to, to, to rifle. And I don't know, you probably watched some of my videos, but like things are clicking now where it's yes. not looking at those really targets that are up close and just knowing that point of aim, point of impact kind of thing, and being able to move fast. like 
my whole rifle game has changed, which has been cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I've absolutely noticed. And it's, it's, it makes me proud to see it. <laughs> Thank you. Now the pistol yeah. side, I just have to hit the paper, but I got the movement ish down. <laughs> yes, there you go. Exactly. Well, we're all, we're always, all of us are still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> like I wasn't mad at my reloads, my movement, yeah. just, just the actual holes that didn't holes appear. In the target. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I'm on match two with that. Yeah, so. nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so going, let's see, going back to your life, um, after MU, so did you apply for para, get recruited for that? Like, I want to know, like, how that came about and what did you do? Yeah, so um, uh, first of all, Max sort of led the way and he, he, he left first with SIG and I was – you know, we, we conferred a lot on that. So I learned some stuff there. Okay. And, um, it was, I think, I think after Max left, I was probably around on the team for another couple of years. I don't remember how much longer, maybe it was three or four, okay. but, um, I, you know, getting to shoot with Todd and, and seeing him and he, he gave me, he's just like, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at retiring and I want to pass the baton Okay. and yeah. And I mean, are you, you know, he kind of got me connected with the owner and the timing was pretty close to being like my tour was my contract with the army was really close to being up. It was like six or eight months or something. Oh, wow. I do remember like working the shot show and doing the demo at the para booth while I was still in the army, which was kind of crazy taking leave to go do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I got to meet the owner Thanos and um, Ben cook, a marketing guy, a really good buddy. And um, we, we, uh, it just, it worked out for me. And, and I guess at that time I was ready to move on from the army. I felt like I I'd accomplished my, my primary goals was to become a national champion and win the exactly. world shoot. Yeah. Exactly. So that was right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There are days when like, I'll tell you, I miss it. Yeah. I, I bet. <laughs> yeah. I think I did nine years, eight or nine years. And I would, it's like, why don't you just finish? But that's okay. <laughs> You're meant to be where you're at, but yes, yes exactly. <laughs> exactly. A lot yeah. of people like don't plan to like get out of the military too. Like I know we have a lot of shooters that are active duty or reserves or whatever that looks like. And it is nerve wracking to figure out a plan, but you kind of have to now like far yes. in advance. Absolutely. You do. I, I really think, um, it should always be in, you know, a thought in your mind and preparing for that moment. Yeah, I'm like Travis, just I uh, don't figure it out. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, what did that's... you like? What was your day to day like at Para though? What did yeah. What did work like like look like? So so um so yeah so I, I finished out like six months or something and I was like consulting mm -hmm. and um, they'd already sent me um, a gun so I was using that in matches and okay. well for the AMU yeah and. Um, and then eventually, um, eventually I got out and what I would do for para is every other week I would drive up to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina from, from basically the Fort Benning area. I was in Columbus. Yeah. And I drive up there and I'd week, I worked the whole week. Wow. And what I would, yeah, I would work on the guns. I would work with customer service. I would work on, uh, designing new products. Wow. Um, yeah, like my first, the, like the first day I was there, I, tr I I converted from this thing known as a power extractor, which was a MIM piece that would often break and it was very difficult to tune. And I and I had already had this deal with EGW going and, and we, we were placed at like the first day. It was awesome. Wow. EGW yeah. is awesome company. Yes, I really. It really them. is. Love yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the, then the next week I would be um, training and going to matches. Okay. And so that's kind of how it worked. It, I did that for a long time. I would live up there for the whole week. And um, gosh, it was, it was, re it was really, we did a lot of really good stuff in that time before Remington bought us out. Yeah. Um, gosh, I did. Another thing I was doing is I would go on to uh, the big 1911 forums mm -hmm. and um, I made these, these, uh, these files where we could, where I could basically quantify the negative post to the positive post, you know, well, my extractor broke or my, my gun's not feeding. And, and I, and I got together with customer service and the, 
the, the COO and we, we all got together and, and just fixed all these parts. It was awesome. But it was like, I was basically working 24 seven at para. Yeah. It and, sounds like it. Yeah. Customer service at that point. Cause they had a track record of some, some products that weren't working so well. So it was like a full-time job. <laughs> There's only one job, which was product development. That's introvert. The rest was all extroverted. Yes, you're exactly right. That is the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. And then Remington, like you weren't there too much longer or no. can't, yeah. You're right. It was, um, gosh, it was like, it was a matter of months again Yeah. that um, Remy, you know, started some suits started showing up at the, at the plant <laughs> and um, we were like, what's going on, you know? And it fa- basically trickled down that um, the, the business would be sold. Uh, there was a f- couple other big companies I probably shouldn't name, but um, Remington had their, their site set. And I can remember the last uh, shot show that I did for para as, a, as when we were an independent. Yeah. And um, I was up there doing my, you know, my, I basically like draws and reload demos up on the stage and I got done and um they're like we you need to go up to this suite with um with the COO and um you've got a meeting with Remington I'm like why are they I'm the pro shooter why am I going up there (laughs) well they asked for you by name we go up there and there's this we walk into this room it's like a gangster thing (laughs) I don't know if I should be talking about this this is great (laughs) and there's probably like eight guys literally in suits and ties not a smile on their face. <laughs> and, and, and they, and, and it was, and they set us down at the table. Like they were like, we were in like a, an interrogation. Right. <laughs> and, and they're like, so we have done testing on all your guns, all your, your whole line. We've done ransom rest testing, the 40 shoots, the two inches at 25, the 45 has a uh, 15% failure rate that all these numbers and they're like, you know, w- what is your plan to fix it? Why should we buy you? And all these questions. And boy, boy, that was a good experience. I've never been in anything like that. You know, I'm just a dude that pulls the trigger. <laughs> you always say that. And then you always end up in these little roles. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> You're really good at that, Travis. You were, the, you were like the diffusing calming presence i don't know i don't know you get yourself into those though i love it yeah <laughs> wild that's awesome yeah so <laughs> yeah i think i think the deal was made and then all of a sudden um you know my paycheck stopped coming from para and it started coming from remington <laughs> and <laughs> things actually changed pretty pretty drastically like i still represented para for maybe like two years. Okay. Yeah. And, um, at some point the decision was made to shut down the pair of na- uh, name and brand mm-hmm. and to just do the 1911 handguns, gotcha. uh, Remington, sorry, sorry, Remington handguns. Yep. So I changed my, my colors and now I was the Remington guy. Dang. Yeah. That's crazy. Like it's, I don't know. I don't know how I would feel about being bought out and changed. I don't know. It was very different. It's, um, you know, uh, it's a little un- un- unsettling. Like you yeah. don't know, like, well, maybe they don't even want your job, you know, your position or, or it was crazy. Cause the CEO, the first time I met the CEO, George, he was like, part of me buying para was I wanted to basically adopt you for Tip anything. Own I was like, dang. <laughs> okay. That sounds cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I like that idea. I like that idea. And, uh, so he was, he was, he was really cool to work with and, and he, he valued like, I, you know, I would, they would, they would fly me out to products that were like prototypes that people were trying to sell to Remington. Yeah. And I go to these really expensive places <laughs> and um, they want me to test it, you know? So they, the like board members and the CEO, like, what do you think of this gun? What do you think? Oh. And I would tell them what I thought and I would get it up to speed, you know, hosing targets. And um, that was a pretty cool pretty cool thing for a while but oh, yeah. then leadership changed so many times we went through a a ba- uh, we went through well while i was there we went through two chapter 11s couple yeah yeah exactly and um but i, I worked with some uh, alongside some really great people yeah yeah uh, yeah it was it was pretty cool dang well travis yeah. being bought <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is weird um 
oh, I'll go ahead and ask you this, but what is weird yeah. is like being in this industry is like, it's, it, it is super humbling and a blessing. And I'm thankful every day is like, we get paid, even though we would probably do it for free, but we get paid to do these things. Like we get to do these things. This is job. Like, I don't even know how to describe that. Like, what is that feeling like? Indescribable. It's indescribable, especially because it's our passion. Yeah. And yet it's what we do for a living. Yeah. It's, yeah. In some ways for me, it never actually, it's never like real. Became, yeah. Real. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It it's was, not uh, real. Like you giggle. No. You're just like, oh, really? <laughs> like what? <laughs> you want me to do what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would pay you to go do that. Yeah. Oh my exactly. gosh. Exactly. It's cool. Yeah. That's good perspective too. I think it's important to keep that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now the TV shows came calling. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to know. <laughs> About this Mythbusters. Episode. Oh yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's and that's when Remington owned Para, but we, but I was still Para. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I got a um, I got an email from the USPSA, and she's like, um, "Hey, Mythbusters is trying to get a hold of you, but we have a policy not just to give people's com contact info out." It's good. And I'm like, good "What? Job. Mythbusters is trying to get a hold of me? What do you mean? I don't know. Here's their number." So I contacted them and they said, Hey, we watch. So there's like this reload video um, on the YouTube that was take basically saw from double alpha was I just graduated basic training. This is, so this is what 2003 or something. Okay. And yeah, basic training in AIT for infantry. It was like four months. I didn't touch a gun or any of that. Or just, just an M4, you know, an M16. Just, and stuff just like that. an M4. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah, exactly. No handguns <laughs> or anything. Right. <laughs> and, um, it, I got out just in time to go to open nationals in Bend, Oregon. Okay. And um, Saul was down. Saul sponsors uh, Max, you know, Double Alpha and all that. And they had a relationship then and, you know, great guy. And he was going to practice with us before we left okay. to nationals. We, and he, oh, because he was videoming nationals back then. Oh, okay. Had yeah, DVDs. <laughs> and um, if Not I'm going to dvds now yeah exactly <laughs> again this is the future vhs was the future. it was betamax vhs and dvds <laughs> it's crazy oh. yeah <laughs> it, it, so we're we had this little office back then we we didn't have our own range really we were underneath a uh, service pistol which was another amu team a much bigger team and um saul's got this big camera and he's like, uh, Travis, I've always admired your reload. Would you do some for me on, on tape or video, whatever? And I'm like, sure, I'll do some. So I did a few. And um, he's like, I'm going to put it on this DVD. And I'm going to put it on YouTube. And I'm like, you do? Yeah. I'm like, why a dry fire video? I'm like, why don't we go out in the range? I'll do it for real. He's like, no, no, just trust me. I'm like, this is, this is cheesy. <laughs> Nobody's going to watch this. And so he puts it on YouTube. And at one point there was, you know, one channel had like 12 million views or whatever. Another one had 10 million. It went on this, uh, what was the name? There was another video thing. I can't remember what it was called. It's gone now. But Vimeo? Um, it was before that. It started with an M. Ooh. But it had like, like millions of comments. MySpace? No, it wasn't MySpace. It wasn't like a social media thing. It was kind of like a version of YouTube, but okay. people could say whatever they wanted. More. Okay. I have no idea. So the comments, some of the comments were dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, anyway, this video had all this view and the Mythbusters people must've seen it and they wanted to do a, an episode. What they told me, they didn't really have any idea. They're like, look, we want to see how you compare to Hollywood. We don't know how we're going to test this, you know, or how to quantify this, but essentially we want a lot of lead going downrange with these speed reload things you guys do. Speed reloads. Yeah. <laughs> or they were like, you know, change clips, all this kind of stuff. I had to them. Oh yeah. It was crazy. So um, I said, are you kidding? I would love to do that. And I, I had to, uh, you know, I was leaving town to do this. So I had to tell Remington. Remington was like, are you kidding? We're going to support this. Oh. However, you know, and um Again, they couldn't tell me what I was going to do. At one point, they're like, We're, you're going to throw the mag up, catch it, and then shoot one-handed. And I'm like, I don't really catch mags that way. That's not something I've ever done. And I don't think they knew what we were going to do to the day oh. to the day we got there. And we were filming in 
we were supposed to be in an outdoor range in San Diego mm -hmm. and it was raining really bad. So they're like, we're switching up to this indoor range. And so we get to the indoor range you know, early and I'm like ready to go. Like, yeah. I don't know what my speaking parts are. I still don't know what I'm going to shoot. <laughs> and these, these paras were sent because it was Remington. Everything was official. So, you, you know, high cap mags and everything in California. So they went to the local PD and they brought them out. And um, so again, I'm wait, I'm waiting like all day. And this, this director actor shows up. Oh man, I can't remember his name. Okay. He directed Iron Man. Um, he acts in, uh, oh shoot, I can never, oh, man. Okay. But anyway, everybody. John Favreau? John. Yes, how did yeah. you know? Yeah, John I Favreau. Googled. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, good job. You have to have that down, yeah. You're amazing. You're an amazing uh, interviewer, by the way. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Uh, so <laughs> John Favreau showed up. I didn't really recognize him, but the whole thing came to a halt. All the crews, the... Um, what was it, Adam and Jamie, the hosts? Yes. And we waited for hours. I'm like, oh, no, this is taking forever. Finally, they decide that they're going to shoot. So they did all their filming with blanks at first. Okay. It was weird. Okay. <laughs> and, they, and there's no timer. They're going to use a stopwatch. I'm like, okay. Now it's getting late, and the range owner comes out, and they're like, you know, at 8 o'clock, we're going to shut down. I don't care if you guys are done or not. And, wow. and basically it came down to me getting one and they would add, they were like, Hey, can you really do this? And I'm like, really do what? Like shoot and reload all this fast. I'm like, well, it's what I do. <laughs> and they're like, well, some of these guys we, we fly in, uh, like there's this guy that was supposed to catch arrows mm -hmm. and we had to fake it. Are we going to have to fake? Yeah. He's like, are we going to have to fake yours? No. And I'm like, I don't even know how you would fake what we do. No, no. no. So they gave me, they gave me one run. And they were just falling over themselves. It was nothing for what we do. Sure. So then they're just like, oh, oh, and they're going crazy. And I'm like, I could do it better. Let give me, let me another try. And they're like, no, it's we gotta we gotta clean up. It's done. One shot after One being here all day, all day. But that is the Travis Tomasi special, and you teach it in your class that you have one opportunity to shoot this one drill, the one stage. So that suits you well. Well said. I love the way you work that in. That's perfect. True. <laughs> yes, yes. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> That's so funny. So that episode gets recorded. Yeah. Like, did you watch yourself when it came out? I did, yeah. That was weird. Because <laughs> then I didn't know, like, they trimmed out a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like, I, my talking parts, basically, I'm just, hey, guys, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even remember if I'm talking that much on there, but I talked more. I tried to t help them because sure. they, they, they come off as like gun guys, but They're when not. you put a pistol in their hand, they were ate up. <laughs> yeah, not at all. <laughs> right. Not so, and they were right. another thing they kept saying, like the crew would say clip. Yeah. And then I'm like, you we need to retake that because we're going to get hammered. I am. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Especially with your name. And the history of it, yeah. Yes, exactly, mm. exactly. That was really cool. There was a reload I did as a B-roll with um, with the um, it's a, it's like a hundred twenty thousand dollar high speed camera that they had to rent, wow. and it was one of the best reloads I've ever done. I, it was probably, I mean, I you know, wide open, getting down in the low fifties. This might have been even a little better. You still you literally push the other mag out. And I'm like, guys, what? Yeah. I, I said, can you guys send me that clip? Mm -hmm. And I told one of the young guys on the crew that was just running the cameras, like, can you please send me that? It was, you captured something that is good for me. Mm -hmm. I would like to have that. And, oh, we assure you we'll get it. I emailed them for months. I'm Mythbusters. Oh. And they never, they was like, it's gone now. Sorry. That, oh. yeah. But it was like such a cool shot with that camera. And it went really well. I was just like, man, I would love to have that. I don't know why I just thought of that. Well, it's something yeah. that you remember. That's why I was thinking. That's kind of intriguing. That's a huge moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It Disappointing Mythbusters, if you're listening. <laughs> yes. We need to see that footage. You didn't show the best one. <laughs> I think the video you have now on the internet uh, where you drop the mag, catch the mag, reload the mag. Yeah. No, you got oh, that. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> That's, that's a headache funny. in and of itself. I'm like, huh? Yeah, that's a guy that needs to get a life. 
<laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> love it. Cause then you went yeah. on to be, I mean, like you were a little bit on the hot shot episodes and then you were on gallery of guns, right? Yes. A lot of gallery of guns used yeah. to do that. Yeah. How did okay. TV and like networks in general, like even shooting us USA change like things for the shooting sports and then maybe even for you a little bit. I think they made them more mainstream and I can prove this to some extent, uh, extent. Uh, especially you brought up a good one shooting USA and that. Um, so after the house we were living in, after I got out of the army, uh, I'm very, I'm very quiet about what I do. I don't show, you know, there's nothing in the garage. I don't, I, I load everything up before I leave. So I, I don't really want anybody to know I'm a shooter. Yeah. Um, but the guy, the guy finally down the street, he says, uh, he's driving by and he says, Hey, I watch you on TV. And I'm like, what do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, you're that shooter guy. I know you are. You're on shooting USA. And I was like, Oh, cool. Well, do you shoot Ipsic? You know, are you SPSA? He's like, no, I have no idea what that is, but I see you. And so I thought that was interesting, you know, in bringing it more our sport anyway, more mainstream what, and what we do. I thought that was kind of cool. It's okay. happened a few times in other places too. Like, Somebody will be like, I think they're mean mugging me. Like I'm in like Home Depot or something. <laughs> I'm like, and, I got, <laughs> and it turns out they're like, hey, I saw you on TV. I'm like, oh, I feel so stupid. I thought you wanted to fight or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And like, I mean, this yeah. is, this is not when like social media kind of was around. So like normally like the, what were the episodes? Top shots. Like when that show came out, oh, yeah. a lot of the social medias of like the shooters really grew and they became like influencers because of that. I think. That's right. With top shot. Very good yeah. point. Yeah. Well, that's right. That made quite a few people. It did. And like, we don't, I don't know. I don't foresee us having an opportunity us as a our two-way community, having another opportunity like that on mainstream TV. I agree. I don't think so. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's that too sucks. bad. Yeah, I would love to see it on a major network, but it kind of goes against what they're pushing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, well, that's cool in the, the TV history. Now, my yeah. favorite part because you are now working with Masterpiece Arms. Yes, I'm honored to be on the team. This is so cool, and um, you've got your own name on a Ooh. firearm. What mm -hmm. is that like? <laughs> Seriously, seeing yeah. like your name on a gun. <laughs> That is, it's, it's such an honor and this more than, so I had one, I had a signature model at Para mm -hmm. and then I had one at Remington. This is a completely, I'm sorry to the people that bought those, but this is a completely different level. Yep. This gun is awesome. Uh, Phil Cashin of Masterpiece Arms is, is a breath of fresh air in the industry. Um, this gun, I, I mean, I'm just so proud of the gun. We have David Law building them and designing them. Yep. And so to your to your point, it's it's a huge honor to, for, to be on this level of gun is incredible. That's awesome that you still get yeah. excited over it's, that. It's amazing. Oh. Yeah. Now, can you share a little bit about like the Masterpiece Arms is known in PRS and, and NRL and all of that, and a lot of people really haven't heard the name, right? So, with this new like competition pistols, like what is the future for Masterpiece Arms? Yeah. So to your point. Masterpiece Arms dominates PRS, right? Um, and supports and sponsors and supports uh, the matches. And is this this huge, um, huge uh, presence that really helps everybody, shooters and matches alike. And that's and we're you're going to see that now with 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 Pistol and with USPSA awesome. and being you know, a major sponsorship of nationals and, and building the team, it's going to be the same thing. Phil, Phil does everything right. Cool. And he absolutely, uh, he's a shooter himself, mm -hmm. which helps, so, which helps. <laughs> yeah. Tremendously. And what I mean, and Phil is the owner of masterpiece. Uh, they're, they're in Comer, Georgia. Yep. And uh, so you're going to see, you're going to see the same thing. And that was one of the things that immediately, um, appeal to me about uh, a shooting for masterpiece was absolutely was was Phil mm -hmm. and his attitude and and a lot of the a lot of the same outlooks as I have for example man if you want to sleep good at night you got to make sure your customers your shooters are taken care of yes and and you know gosh he'll spend time with people who haven't even bought a gun yet mm -hmm. helping them out mm -hmm. and and he's like 
whatever it takes. I love that whatever it takes because that's the way I approach things. And yeah. uh, it's a breath of fresh air on my end. I mean, right? Huge. To yeah. I'm like, I'm a nobody, right? So I, I am a nobody. That's <laughs> not true. That's not true. A little bit where no it's way. like the fact that you guys are innovating too, like with the different grip textures and just like making sure I'm taking care of. Phew, it's sad. I love our industry and I don't want to criticize anybody cross board because I think our Absolutely. companies are amazing. It just, it, I'll just say MPA is a class act above all so far in making sure that we have what we need when we need it fast. Well said you summed it up perfectly yeah. and they're, and they're that way for, for all everybody. the customers. Yep. For every nobodies and the Travis's. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but I'll, you know, another thing you'll notice is the constant innovation and improvement. Yes. And, and we just leave another thing like Phil sees eye to eye with me and leaving no, stu- st- uh, you know, no stone unturned. Yeah. And, um, and there's no challenge too big. I love that. <laughs> it's cool. And like, so, okay, we've got, of course, the, the 40 cal, the nine mil, we've got now a defender series and then yes. open guns already out in the market and these price points, how? That's okay. Yep. So when you, when you make everything in house Mm -hmm. and, and you have the, you know, the manufacturing capability, Phil's a grandmaster and he did automotive and stuff that was way harder than this before. Okay. So, um, you have this incredible wealth of knowledge. Um, you have somebody who hires the right people. Look at David. I mean, he is not just a phenomenal shooter. Yeah. But he's he's an incredible machinist, incredible gunsmith. He's a total yeah. nerd, which I love too. But he's enthusiastic yes. about he's talking about everything. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I love it. And he's a he also has that that attitude of, you know, you you're not going to stop me. I'm going to yeah. figure out a way to do it. And yeah. so he gets these things done, and he does it so he does it so well. Um, it's just such a strong team, and you know, to your point, more and more products all the time, more offerings. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, we're going, we're with things are moving fast. They are and yeah. yet, in masterpiece arms will be a household name. If it isn't already in USPSA for sure. Can't Very wait. Quickly. Yeah. Now I know you've got a gun in front of you and I know people ask me this all the time and they don't believe me when I show them like, this is the little details, right? They make the trigger with their little M the oh, Maxwell yes. MPA. So yes. do you want to go over the features of, of this 2011 and like everything that you said that they build in house? Yes, absolutely. So, so we, 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 we basically everything is hand assembled. Um, it's machined out of bill, billet and bar stock. So no MIM, no cast, no, nothing that you don't want in the gun. Yeah. You know, everything is going to hold up. It's going to last. And we, uh, the design of the slide is, is, is pretty big deal. Uh, it's tri topped. And these aren't just like inadvertently placed, these slots, these slide lightning. Everything is tuned so the, the reciprocal weight of the slide. It's why your sights track so well and why the felt recoil feel, feels so good. And, and the, the way that we've spec'd it out, you know, we're using the Koenig hammer and sear and disconnector. We don't make those in-house, but we get the best stuff. Yeah, It's not something we're making. Um, we even make the, the barrels in-house. Yeah. Yep. 416 stainless and it's it's done just like the bench uh, bench rest rifle barrels it's just shorter um bowl barrel and you've got our long dust cover now we're making our grips we have the different textures <laughs> which i got <laughs> to test all three <laughs> yes okay awesome exactly and, and 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 in different materials as well you know this one's in stainless we've got the aluminum oh. we got the different uh colors and coatings and, um, yeah, and you could see like, it's, it's ready to go. You've got the way that the grip is the ergonomics, you know, we put so much into this. Love it. The trigger weight, the, the awesome magwell. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then when people order it, you know, they can go through that. Yes, exactly. You can do the different uh, colors and there's, there's so many options. Yep. Um, yeah. Trigger shoes, all that. I, yeah. I'm excited. Yes. yes, exactly. Another thing that's, that's important to me is the way that the thumb safeties fit and the way they're sculpted. I mean, things like that, all the little details. And we just go through every little part we can and, and, you yeah. know, make it the way it shoots. Shooters, 
and competitors making guns for shooters and competitors. It's huge. That's the difference yeah. with a lot of the, the companies, a lot of the companies. It's so much, and it's so much different than my past experience where you had <laughs> engineers <laughs> who were, and not to talk bad about them, they oh, were great but, engineers, yeah. but they, they weren't shooters. Yeah. Certainly not at the level that we are. Yeah. But I at think, MPA, you do. I think everyone, bless their hearts, I think everyone that, that's not a shooter, it's really difficult. Like I've seen marketing, like they don't know to check the pictures. They don't know what to say. They don't know the, the words. I mean, they're so, it's just so hard. And they might be the best marketer. And like normally marketing is the same across industries. It, it's just not for our industry. A one hundred percent. I can I can concur with you because I ran into that so often. Yeah. Yes, uh, you're exactly right. <laughs> and I think people who haven't actually maybe been inside the industry or maybe not realized that 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 a lot of these people that are doing that and making the decisions in the bigger companies, they might you know they may have came from GE or or yeah. making toilets or marketing <laughs> toilets, you know, and now, and now they're trying to do a, a firearm and it's just, <laughs> that's what you just thought of is toilets. <laughs> well, cause I do, I actually do some, <laughs> I had, yeah, I've worked with people inside the industry that engineered anything you could think of golf carts, automotive game from Honda, Mercedes. I mean, it, just about anything you can think of. Oh. Yep. And they, and they end up at some of these bigger companies and the masterpiece arms were all shooters. Yep, yep. I love yeah. it. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait. You know, masterpiece stopped out the big way in Nationals. And I've gotten texts about that too. You know, like, wait, they're sponsoring Nationals. I was like, yeah, we we yeah. picked up that torch, and I'm really honored and excited that that's gonna be a big deal. Yes, me too, as well. And huge thanks to to Phil and the team for for picking that up and yeah. supporting the match so that we can hold it. It's it's awesome. Yeah, 100 percent Yeah. Now, we went into a little bit of the car stuff. You've been talking about it, hitting at it, hitting at it. So yeah. <laughs> tell me about tell me about the truck you drive and the obsession where all of this car stuff came from. Oh yeah. Well, great question. So um, you know where it starts is my dad. My dad was a mechanic and he had his own repair shop. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in that environment. Um he he had a a very a very strong business in Bellevue, Washington. He did uh, Porsches, worked on mm -hmm. Porsches. And um, so that's kind of where I probably didn't have any choice to be a total car nut. You know, it was it was really uh, it was really in my blood. And uh, I started working on things and it wasn't my, like my dad spoon fed any of this stuff. He's like, take it apart and then put it back together. Oh, you make a mistake. Yeah, you make a mistake, but do it. Just do it. Take it apart. <laughs> I loved it. And that and that was sort of, um, you know. My dad was a, is a big influence on me and uh, amazing mechanic and he got me into shooting and also into cars. <laughs> Two very expensive hobbies. Thanks, Dad. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I've been draw I've I've, diff I've had different cars over my life, but I've been stuck on these uh, Gen Two Ford Lightnings since I guess I got my first one um, in '04. And that's when they stopped making them. But um, that was in the army. I was a private and I bought a brand new Sonic Blue Ford Lightning 04. And I've just daily driven those. Like now I have another one, a Dark Shadow Gray DSG 04. And, uh, you know, supercharged V8. The suspension is done. The exhaust and just uh, they're fun to me. It's like I can I can haul my shooting stuff. But then also you can, you know, you can, you can play with Corvettes and things like that. And <laughs> Love it. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> what would be your bucket list dream car if you could buy it? It won't. Yeah. Oh, bucket list dream car. What would you buy? Oh, bucket list dream car. Um, shoot, that is hard. Uh, so another, I'm kind of weird. Like if it's not something I have the ability hmm. to have immediately, I don't think about it too yeah. much, but that is a great question. I want to, I want to think of something. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, man, that's hard. Gosh, Come really good question. Yeah, Come you back. got me. Okay. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so my final, final questions I had is about the professional instruction that you're doing now. So you've got your training website, you're doing a little bit of online, like kind of mentoring, teaching, and then you do in-person classes. So when did you start that? 
why, I know you mentioned that you love teaching, but why did you start that? Um, and what are you teaching? Yeah. So, um, I started, I started doing classes like a long time ago, like 95 or 96. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I did it because people were asking, that's what really started it. Yeah. Um, and it, it probably wasn't until my first class in the middle that I'm like, I love, I really enjoy this. I really love it. And I love the fact. Uh, so, so I'm constantly adding new material and, and new blocks of instruction. Yeah. Um, so, and I also want to offer uh, different material of it than that is out there. Um, so, you know, we all sort of emphasize different things, but a lot of, a lot of what is taught when it comes to the basic mechanics is the same. Mm -hmm. um, I get into other areas. And so that keeps me in, I, and I, cause I'm interested in that yeah. and I always want to dissect things and, and expand my own knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then even, you know, whether it's shooting or teaching, it's the same thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I've been doing it for, for quite a while now. Gosh, that's a long time. <laughs> you haven't stopped to think about it, have you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. There was times when I worked for Remington where um, I wasn't able, due to my schedule, I wasn't able to do group classes yeah. and things like that because I was working so many shows okay. and I was, I was dragged into so many different aspects of the business. I can't even tell you how many different things I did. <laughs> um, that got in the way of teaching. It got in the way of shooting too. Yeah. Shooting no, I, we, we, it's hard to tackle everything. And I, I feel bad. Like, I guess my personal life suffers. I don't really see my family love them though, but, yeah. but my schedule's booked out for the whole year. I know exactly where I'll be, when I'll be. And it sucks, but it's, yeah. it's also a blessing. So I don't want to complain and just, you know, keep it up for now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. No, you're doing awesome. And that's, that's the, I think that's the great way to do it. And it's hard to take a break and then see and see your family as much as you want to, but yeah, um, yeah. you know, mine are on the other side of the country. So it's, it's been pretty difficult. Yeah. You've uh, got to stop what you're doing and leave. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Dang. Um, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so, okay. You have the two day performance pistol class. Yes. Private instruction as well. Correct. Yes. Correct. What I'm up? not doing as much as the online training as I used to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's um. It was like COVID-ish time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was doing a lot then. Yeah, o almost all of it was for a period was online through yeah. Zoom, and um, it. I'll tell you, it was great though. I, I um, there was a level of analysis, a depth of analysis that I went into that I hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. Just not being able to be with the with the person in uh, live, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. um, the amount of the type of software I was using to break things down, there was some, I, I learned some stuff myself just, yeah. just from that. So that was pretty cool. But if I can, my, 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 the favorite thing is to be on the range with somebody so I can. You have to see it, feel it. Yes. I'm not your caliber. I teach this weekend just for like handgun carry permit, but like you can see awesome. the trigger pressure and the grip and all of the body stuff that you just can't. And I love that it's a firearms is an in-person thing. And then I hate it because it's an in-person thing. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> like, I want to teach right. my friends, family, but it's like, you guys got to come to me or I got to yes. be in town. So there's just such a barrier sometimes to that because you have to find an indoor and outdoor range or membership range or it's a lot. It is. I, you, you, yeah. You summed it up perfectly. I can remember going back to visit my mom and some of her girlfriends were like, we need, you know, they've all bought guns. There yep. was a period there, you know, during the during the whole COVID thing where people were buying new gun owners like crazy, right? Like over 10 million transfers or something. Yeah. But, uh, and they, and I was like, well, okay, first we need a range mm -hmm. and that I can, you know, can accommodate us. And then we, you guys got to find ammo and all this stuff. And it's, it's, they didn't understand like, Oh, this is going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. To and this it, out. Yeah. And I think that's a barrier to entry for sure. I, I mean, I, I bring it and compare it to like fishing or hunting. You got to get a license, nowhere to go. I mean, I, we forget, I think, um, in the industry, I just think we forget that how difficult and challenging it is if you're out there and they don't know where to start, where to go. How, do I show up to the range? Like eyes, ears, are they going to be mean to me? Do I, like yes. own, a gun, own a gun? They don't know. Oh, I agree completely. And like you said, we forget about that. We've already gone through that process, yeah. and, but you're right. They have no, they really have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but it, it's, it's like, 
<laughs> I get it. There's a barrier. So like, that's yeah. where I like with gals in the events and just what I tell people. And, and we start at the very beginning, bringing one person on helps. And that one person will bring somebody on and just the small impact and the small, we've seen it like the small things will add up to a big thing over time. So. That's huge. I want to thank you for doing that. But by the way, that is so what? awesome what you're doing. I got to have Jana next year. Come. And nice. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, you're helping people. You're doing a great service. You're helping us. You're helping the second amendment. Thank um, you. I just really appreciate it. when I see that stuff. I love it. So oh, thank you. That was a lot of fun. I, well, I had that idea in Florida and then that, there was like seven or 10 women. And then I come to Tennessee and I'm like, we got to cut this off at 75. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. You know, it's overwhelming. Cause we probably could have done a hundred then like next year we're on do 200. I'm like, I need more help and sponsors and yeah. Wow. So yeah. if you're listening, people, I need more ROs next year, Mother's Day weekend, Saturday. <laughs> awesome. Mother's Day, Mother's Day weekend, Saturday of 23. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. We need help. More okay. hands on deck. There we go. Um, yes. Now I, I have glossed over this. I forgot about this. You brought up ammo. Okay. Travis, your team federal. Congrats. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very proud of that. I've always wanted to represent federal. Uh -huh. So that was a big deal. And I love the ammo. I'm using the Syntec 205 grain on my 40. Nice. So soft. What's so the power awesome. factor on that one? So out of my masterpiece arms, it's been doing anywhere from like 172 or 171 to 173. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so it's, it's just right. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Cool. So clean too. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Congrats. That, that's Thank a big, you. big deal. And for people listening, go listen to... Who did the podcast? Jason was on it with, I want to say Hunter's HD Gold and talked about it. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that came out last December. You didn't even know that it was announced oh. that you're on the team. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Jason is awesome. I love that guy. He, he was the one that gave me the open minor pistol when my gun went down at Nationals last year and ammo to finish the match. And that on that, oh. that it was on that podcast too. He's like, Yeah, I got to watch Kenzie run that gun like a sewing machine. And people were like, Has she shot an open gun before? I'm like, mm -mm. But I'm gonna oh. I'm gonna just go fast because it was really fun. I love it. That is awesome. So Jason, he, wow. is, he is the best person out there on the range for sure. He's amazing. What a great heart. He yes. he's just incredible. Yes. Yeah. So, that is awesome. I now, yeah. really, my final questions here are. What is next for Travis Tomasi? Maybe things we know about, don't know about, you know, what's this end of the year coming up for you look like and all of that? Yeah. So um, I, I still have match wise. I still have um, some areas. You and I are shooting area five. That's like my next match. A couple weeks. Too. Yes. yes. <laughs> can't wait. I'm, I'm pumped about that. Excited about that. And then uh, nationals and um, uh, private classes, group classes. And, um, oh, got some cool stuff next week. I'll do some videos with Phil for Masterpiece Arms. Looking nice. forward to that. Yeah. And, um, and, and just helping in that regard and, uh, con continuously working on the, on the releasing the next gun as well. And, um, it's awesome. David and I, we, we work together just constantly. <laughs> um, it's so awesome having that opportunity to just, you put your minds together and, Oh, yeah. And uh, it's just a really unique uh, setup that we have. And that you'll see that in the guns, how great the guns are. And you drive over there and like just spend like a week or whatever. Yeah, I, I haven't done a full week yet, but it'll, it'll be a day or two. Yep, exactly. Cool. Yeah, I love it. It's awesome. It's, <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool. um, are you shooting any Ipsic matches coming up? Or are you doing World Shoot if they have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Unfortunately, I, I um, the last qualifier for that, uh, my Remington, the barrel broke on a 32 round field course. So I, I didn't actually get a slot this time, but I'll be there next time for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I had all kinds of issues with my Remingtons. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was, oh. it was brutal. Thank you though. Yeah, it was a brutal. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Awesome. No, you don't, but I can't. It's like when it's gear and it's not you. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was, there was a period there where, um, I was paying more dues equipment wise with the, <laughs> yes. Yep. With my Remington's. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so final question ish, and this one might be a little hard summer. 
can you share maybe the top five most common things that shooters do wrong and how they can improve upon them? Simple stuff. Ooh, okay, good. So um, first of all, the grip. Man, I would like to be able to help everybody with their grip. <laughs> Per, uh, particularly, I would say um, the way that they seat their hands on the gun, uh, both the firing hand and the support hand. I would like to, you know, uh, like to correct some of the geometry and the, the pressures and get them higher. I like to be as high as possible. Okay. Um, that that one always come. That one always sticks out immediately. I would like to see. So especially when we're talking speed, a lot of people run. Uh, run the gun with a lot of antagonistic muscle tension. What does that mean? Like, so what I mean by that, that is in the muscle groups that are working counter to the protagonist groups. Okay. So in which you will, you will see those, especially in the traps or raising the delts, the shoulders, mm -hmm. and you'll see it in their face. Yeah. The face is that external tension gauge that I use when I want to see how tense somebody is. Okay. And, and the problem with all this tension is it acts as a break and it acts as a governor or a barrier. And you will find, as I did, you get to a point where you feel like you're up against the wall speed wise, let's say, and you haven't made any improvements on known drills or stages in months, years. A lot of people get stuck in B class for their yeah. whole career. Yeah. And a lot of it, the root of this, a lot of it is this, uh, this tension. So learning to, I don't want to say relax but use the right amount of tension for the job at hand and to really take that uh, some of those, those muscle groups that are counter to the activity or the function, mm -hmm. um, reduce that tension. And you see immediately you start, as I did personal, I started establishing personal records. Huh. Um, yeah. Just transitions got faster, draws, reloads, everything got faster. All that tension takes longer to get into. It yeah. takes longer to get out of. So it impacts your movement. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge one. Okay. Um, another one common you see is, uh, unfortunately, you see the way that people function the trigger. And this is another of those things that's on YouTube a lot. Um, people, people shooting to reset. So what they're doing, yeah, bringing the trigger back and then riding the, sh the trigger back out to it resets. And there's this whole, well, you need the audible click. And unfortunately that's permeated a lot of even our, even our circles. Yeah. Um, not as bad, but I, I mean, I still see it. Yep. And um, I tell just people like, to just forget about the reset. Really. It's, it's that trigger pull is important and figuring out the wall. Cause a lot of the new shooters, yes. they have no clue what I'm talking about, but I try to just at that level, let's, let's not worry about the reset. Just get your finger off. Like, <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I love that. Make them aware of the wall. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, and then let's see some other things. Another thing that I see a lot is um, a very non-aggressive stance. Yeah. Uh, foot position and what I what I would say not a lo low enough center of gravity. So, and that's going to come from knee bend, you know, and knees over toes. And and I would like to see wider stances. I've used a wide, a very wide stance, and there's reasons to that. Um, target transitions. It helps to lower the center of gravity along with the knee bend. And it gives you a more plant. You're more planted when you're shooting and it's more athletic and aggressive to get out of position. Right. Getting into position. It's something that you do have to work on to integrate that aggressive stance into your position entries and stay there and stay there. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Like yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As, as did I, and as, and I, you know, I still catch myself and I catch a lot of people doing it. And, yeah, like, why did um, you, I watched the video. I'm like, and, and, it. you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, you pause. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Just watching people. Yeah. That the videos help when you watch yourself afterwards, for sure. That is a huge, what a great resources of videos. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, you can't hide from that. And it's going to be abundantly clear what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I think that's four, four-ish. Is that four? Okay. Yep. And um, let's see. Okay. Another one that, that, I, that I do see and, and talking about target transitions, people tend to inherently, um, both with a dot and with iron sights, is they tend to allow the gun 
um, to recover on the final shot on the current target, they allow the gun to recover onto this target before they start transitioning laterally, if it may be, um, from a mechanical perspective. Um, and you know, it's, it's in the end, it's slow and it's, it's this, uh, all this added follow through that you don't need. The gun is recovering. If you're shooting a 10 yard target, like I said, the bullet's going to be in the barrel. A uh, bullet's going to be in the burn before the gun yeah. recovers in the barrel. It better For be me, it's in the barrel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there's, there's this huge amount of inefficiency where people fire that first shot, the gun lifts and recovers. They fire that second shot, it lifts and recovers. And even if they break from the sight or the dots visually and start to Look. lead with their eyes, you'll see the gun still recover. Okay. And essentially, you know, I'm wanting, uh, if it's like a three yard or let's say the target separation is a yard, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to get the gun pretty much almost all the way over to the next target before it recovers. Right. Okay. And still shoot an A, that final shot. So. <clears throat> Use the recoil almost as movement to the next. Yes, that's that's okay. that's a thought process that I think it helps people start to integrate yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. But also being like uh, visually hungry is what I would call it to get your eyes on that next target and beat the gun if you can yeah. beat the gun there, and it'll 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 tend to it'll sort of work its its way out uh, yeah. if you if you're visually hungry and. And and in the, the and if you if you look at it from a tempo or a split tempo, mm -hmm. meaning I want I want my my transitions to be almost the same split as or the same time as my shot split. Yes, yeah, this is another thing that works. But yeah, that's that's something that that I see a lot. Okay, these are good stuff. Yeah. So if people want to learn more. What's your website? <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's travistomossi.com. There we go. Easy enough yeah. to remember. Um, yeah, pretty easy. And you can um, you can contact me at travistomossi at gmail.com or travis at travistomossi.com, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> <laughs> you've got Instagram. You've got a shooting Facebook business page. I mean, yeah, you're very accessible. Or contact yeah. MPA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any of that works. Exactly. Love it. Well, yeah. Travis, are there any other final thoughts that you want to leave listeners with, whether it's about competitive shooting, mindset, general life, you know, anything like that? I do want to answer the question you, at, you asked previously. Okay, that you stumped me on. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit old school here, but a Ferrari F40. Ooh, okay. Yes, twin turbo V8, basically a street legal race car. I, I was a little kid when that came out and I had like the die cast models. And so if you said you like you said money was no object, I would have an F40. Okay, are you and an F1 fan? I'm sorry. Uh, are yeah, you an a little bit. I haven't been watching it much lately, but yeah, I, I watch it. Yeah. Okay. Carlos Sainz is doing really good for Ferrari. Yes, he, yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> That's the truth. Huh? He's pretty on the eyes, ladies. Go watch. No. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I didn't realize that part, but yeah. <laughs> pretty. <laughs> Well, why would you? But yeah, right. <laughs> oh gosh. Awesome. Sorry, I interrupted you. So the Ferrari. Okay. Yeah, that that would probably be. Yeah. Okay. I love it. <laughs> any other <laughs> any other tidbits? <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Okay, I'll leave I'll leave you with this, my friends. So um there we if this is an endeavor that you want to pursue, there will be there will be some ups and there will be some downs. There'll be a lot of downs. And there'll be times when you, when you question, it is what you're doing. You will think that um, no matter how hard I try, how much effort I, I put into this, it's not happening. Um, the one thing I would like you to take from me is never give up. Love it. Love never it. give up. And every resilient. Too. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Love it. Travis, thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom for free for all of us listening. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. You're yes. amazing. You're amazing interviewer, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and thank you for the opportunity for Masterpiece Arms. Um, I don't take that lightly. I very, very much appreciate it. And it's an honor to shoot with you. I enjoy everything about you. So thank awesome. you. Awesome. And it's an honor having you on the team. We're so proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited for what's next for all of us. So 
Uh, me as well. So excited. It's going to be fun and we're going to do a lot of great things. Can't wait. My first time shooting on a squad with you, Area 5. <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be so good. I'm going to love it. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Love it. Well, listeners, stay tuned for more episodes. Thank you for Travis coming on. And if you're shooting nationals this year, go thank Masterpiece Arms for sponsoring it. And they picked up a huge torch, you know, to host that. So it's awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Reticle Up podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Follow along on social media at Reticle Up or 3 Gun Kenzie.